Hello, Alex here, and in this video, I want to talk about Kodak's HZ110 black and white film developer and what you need to know about it in terms of safety, handling, and disposal. This video was sponsored by the folks at thephotoshop.ie, who have partnered with me for this educational video and educational video series on photographic chemical safety. More about them later, but for now, let's get into it. As always, a couple of disclaimers before we really get into it. The opinions expressed within this video are my own professional and educated opinions, but are still just opinions and don't supersede or overrule your local laws or regulations in any capacity. They do not constitute legal advice on behalf of myself or the staff of the, at the photoshop.ie. And if you have any serious questions, you should contact your local council, city or other regulatory board. But if you have any general questions, feel free to drop a comment down below, send me an Instagram DM or an email or something like that. At each stage, I'm going to give HD 110 a rating out of three for safety, handling, disposal, and of course, cost. And then we'll tally the scores up at the end and see how it fares compared to the only other developer we've covered at this stage, Rodanol. The last thing now is my nose is quite blocked and stuffy. I'm a bit unwell at the moment. So if the framing changes partway through the video, it's because I packed up for the evening and I did the rest of it tomorrow. Like any black and white developer, the purpose of HD 110 is to take your latent image crystals in your exposed film of just three to four silver atoms and reduce silver ions in the surrounding unexposed silver halide onto them, growing them from nano crystals that you can't even see into a visible array of crystals that we call our actual developed negative. HD 110 has been around in one form or another since about 1962, I think, the early 60s anyway. And there are two main formulations, the old one that I won't be talking about and the new one from 2019, which is what I have here. The main differences between these are something I will touch on later on, but basically most of what I say in this video will hold true for the old version as well. HC110 is sold in one liter bottles of a very thick syrupy concentrate that starts out as sort of a straw yellow color when it's new, turning to a darker yellow and slightly orange color as it ages. Aside from actual film development, you can use it for like fine art papers, like fine art prints or glass plates. Um, Kodak say that themselves, but you also see that in channels like Lost Light Art, where he makes zebra dry plates, which he develops quite commonly in HC110. It's his favorite developer. You should check his stuff out if you're in, interested in glass plates whatsoever. I'm very much thinking about picking up a holder and a box of plates during the summer, but we'll see how that goes. Even within film development, HT110 has a reputation as being pretty damn good for developing expired film. For those who are familiar with characteristic curves, we would say that HT110 has quite an upswept curve rather than an S-shaped curve. For those who don't know what that means, basically, it doesn't develop your shadows as much and in your final negatives, you would have thinner, darker shadows than you would with some other developers while maintaining the D-max or the density in your highlights. So with expired film where fog sits in your shadows and ruins your black point, you could suppress that development by using HC110 versus something else like, I don't know, D76, ID11, Rodanol. HC110 is quite a strong solvent developer, so it's quite ideal for a lot of T-grain films. Although I personally don't like it for Delta 100 or Delta 3200, which is all I've personally tried in the T-grain world with HC110, some people like my friend Max absolutely swear by it for Delta films. So as a solvent developer, it works well for both classic cubic grain films and modern T grain films. Unlike most developers where your dilution is usually specified in the format 1 plus N, like 1 plus 4, 1 plus 25 or whatever, HC 110's dilutions have letter names like A, B, F. And the reason for this is that there are set final dilutions that can be used, but Kodak defined them based on either direct dilution of the concentrate or the preparation of a 1 plus 3 working solution, which thins out the, the stock concentrate to a more manageable viscosity, which you then dilute further as appropriate. There is a table in the datasheet to give you an idea of what how to prepare these various dilutions, and there are both official Kodak dilutions and community dilutions like dilution H, which is, or H, which is just half the concentration of dilution B for twice as long. One consequence of the highly complicated and complex formula, which you would expect from a modern solvent developer, and we'll talk about the chemical composition shortly, is that for very high concentrations, dilution A, dilution B, for example, the actual development time can be uncomfortably short for certain films in the region of like two minutes 45 to four minutes. 
And for a lot of people, that's kind of in the uncomfortably inconsistent range, especially if you're working with larger tanks, like you're doing a few rolls of 120 in a one liter tank, the actual fill and drain time can be just a bit too much for what a lot of people like. Now, those times are quite similar to what you see with C41 development, but not everybody's comfortable with C41 development. Admittedly, those times are quite short, so a lot of people opt to go for the weaker concentrations, dilution H, dilution F, that kind of thing. I'm reading from my notes here and I'm not even going to pretend to have learned all of this off. Hydroquinone, 10 to 20%. This is your primary developer that reduces silver halide or the silver ions of the surrounding silver halides onto your latent image crystals, growing them into visible silver crystals in the final negative. Next is potassium sulfide at 10 to 20% and this serves two roles. The first is an antioxidant to preserve the lifetime of the developer or increase its longevity, especially in the presence of oxygen because sulfide is an oxygen scavenger. It will preferentially react with oxygen, say in the headspace of your bottle versus the developer itself being oxidized by that atmospheric oxygen. Second purpose is in very high concentrations. I don't know exactly where the threshold is. At higher concentrations, it can act as a solvent for the silver. So it will contribute depending on concentration to the smoothness or roughness of your grain by having or not having solvent action for your growing silver crystals. Diethylene glycol in five to 10% serves three roles more or less. The first is that it will inhibit oxidation to some degree. It's sort of a weak antioxidant. The second is, is that in this kind of concentration, it will inhibit bacterial or fungal growth, which could be a problem. And the third is that it's an organic solvent. Nothing in any way related to the concept of a silver solvent developer, but it's a, an organic solvent. Think like acetone or naphtha. This will help keep some of the components of this mixture dissolved in the solution so they don't just precipitate out as a solid. Because if you get precipitates out of your developers, it's not always possible to get everything to redissolve, in which case the developer is basically dead. Next is sodium decaborate tetrahydrate at one to 3%. This is just borax. It's a mild alkali or base that will increase the pH of your working solution and it acts as an accelerator, increasing the activity of the developers in that working solution. Diethanolamine at 0.1 to 1% is another weak silver solvent which will contribute to the solvent action of your final developer solution and it's also a very mild accelerator but not to the same extent as borax. The penultimate component is potassium hydroxide at 0.1 to 1% and this is just there for pH adjustment to increase the pH and make the overall concentrate and then your working solution a bit more basic or alkaline. The final thing is 1,2-benzene-diol, orthohydroquinone aka Catacol. It's the third and final developer and it just does developer things. So overall we have three developers, two accelerators and a few different stabilizers and other additives. So it's a pretty complex mixture like I said, which unfortunately is expected of a modern solvent developer. There are a few differences between the old and new HC110 formulae, but I want to break down the two main ones. The first is that our current formulation contains just a few percent of diethylene glycol, where the old formula contains somewhere in the region of 30 to 35 percent. Diethylene glycol is hundreds of times more viscous than water, and that is the main reason that the old formula is so much more viscous and syrupy than the current one. If you think the new one is bad, the old one is absolutely crazy. It's almost like pitch or honey by comparison. The second is that the older formulation contains potassium bromide as a restrainer, and that was kind of factored into the formulation. The new version contains no restrainer whatsoever. There are some discussions online where people add HC110, add, add benzotriazole to HC110 as a restrainer to the new formula. And, but there are still some people who claim that it contains benzotriazole naturally. It actually doesn't. And that most likely reason for that is that they're misreading 1,2-benzene-diol as sounds like a benzotriazole kind of thing, where that's just the catechol, the third and final developer. So I actually contacted Kodak Alaris to confirm this and they did in fact confirm by email that neither formula ever contained benzotriazole and it's just that the original formula has potassium bromide, the new one has no restrainer whatsoever. For 35 millimeter film with dilution B, you need just under 10 milliliters of the concentrate. So you would expect to get about 100 rolls out of a one liter bottle. For dilution F, you need just under four milliliters, I think 3.8 or 3.9 milliliters of the concentrate for a roll. So you'd expect that you would get about 260 rolls out of the bottle, again, if you did every single roll for that dilution. 
In 120, I think these numbers are a bit lower at somewhere in the region of 70 and 150, maybe 60 and 160 rolls per bottle at those dilutions. Broadly speaking, depending on format and dilution, you can expect somewhere in the region of, I guess, about 70 to 200 rolls of film on average, assuming you're not using the same dilution from roll to roll. Last thing on the note of capacity, the stronger working solutions, A and B, can be reused a couple of times without replenishment. And there was a replenishing solution available for the old formulation, but I don't think it's available for the new formulation. Or if it is, I can't find any reference to that. In terms of shelf life, the stock concentrate will officially last for about two years, but people have been using the same bottles since like 2019 when it came out, four years later, and they're still kicking. So, you know, four to five years with a little reasonable care, keeping it reasonably free from oxygen, away from heat, etc. That's not unreasonable by any stretch of the imagination. So it doesn't last as long as something like Rodinal, but it will last longer than your D76 or your Color Chems. Kodak provide the following lifetimes in months for the one plus three stock solution and various working solutions of given dilutions. As expected, the more concentrated solutions last a lot longer and the lifetime of the working solution is greatly reduced when stored in a bottle that's only partially filled. And this is due to the oxygen in the headspace in the container. You can eliminate that risk by using an oxygen displacing gas like a protectant spray to remove the oxygen from the headspace. Then the bottle is effectively full as far as oxygen is concerned. HC110 is flagged with a range of different hazard classes and it has all sorts of things you have to worry about, unfortunately. It comes with multiple specific targeted organ toxicities, which are the kind of the bad class of health hazard as far as these things go. The more things you need to be like really concerned about, the most worrying of which in my opinion are reproductive toxicity and germ cell mutagenicity. Broadly speaking, if you are pregnant, think you may be pregnant or are, have given birth recently and are still breastfeeding, Stay away from this stuff. More generally, it is a sensitizer. So where you think you are okay with it, in a few years time, you might start being what feels like allergic to it. It will become an irritant where it once wasn't and it can cause chronic skin conditions like dermatitis. So it's the kind of thing that gets worse as time goes on effectively. Section four and the first aid measures appear to be pretty normal and boilerplate to start off with, but then you really dig into it and see that it isn't just irritating to the eyes, it actually can cause straight up blindness. At least the concentrate. I'm not sure about the working solutions, but that will depend on the dilution that you work with. Nevertheless, keep this stuff away from your eyes. The other thing in terms of safety when it comes to this stuff is dealing with that thick syrup can be quite difficult in a safety sense. If you get some on your skin, it's going to take a while to actually just rinse it off, even with warm water. If you've ever been exposed to the oils of something like poison ivy, then you'll know that the best way to get rid of it is not rinsing or using any kind of a spray, but actually just mechanically rubbing it off with a cloth. So if you get HG110 on your skin, the best thing to do is get a towel or something and rub it off your skin and then start rinsing because just the flow of water itself probably won't be enough to completely just slough it off your skin before it can actually start doing damage. Section seven is thankfully pretty standard. And do remember that this applies to like industrial scale usage of the concentrated syrup, not necessarily a working solution, but the general rules still apply. If you spill a lot of it, use something like tissue or paper towel to kind of mop it up and then start rinsing. Same thing, like I said, for your skin, don't just start rinsing the surface down. You want to kind of mechanically remove as much of it as possible before you start using water to treat spills. Here, section eight is actually too long to show on screen all at once. The first part is quite irrelevant for our purposes, but I'll leave it on screen for a second so you can pause and look at it if you wish. The second part is where it gets a bit more spicy. All of the harmful components of HC110 can be readily absorbed through the skin. So it is very strongly recommended to work with this stuff while wearing gloves, and I do agree with that. And in a ventilated space, again, I agree with that, but I would add, even though it's said elsewhere, just to be clear, that you should wear eye protection as well because of that mention of the risk of blindness from exposure of your eyes to the concentrate or the stock working solution, which is not that much weaker. We can see the toxicity figures for the main worrisome components here expressed in the format of an LD50. This is the lethal dose that will give a 50% chance of killing you per kilogram of body weight. Gasoline or petrol is uh, in the region of what, like 15,000, 12,000 milligrams per kilogram? and table sugar is at 30,000. So like these aren't acutely toxic and they're gonna instantly kill you, 
but they are more worrisome in terms of their long-term health effects. This is reflected in the fine detail where you see that multiple things here are suspected carcinogens and you have to consider the specific targeted organ toxicities, kidney damage, damage to unborn fetuses, reproductive toxicity. None of those things are good just because it is, isn't immediately and acutely toxic. I'm going to give HC110 a 1 out of 3 for safety. Although the risks aren't immediately obvious, they do accumulate over time and many of them are chronic. If you think about something like a mild rodinal burn, that hurts pretty bad and, you know, it can make your skin very scaly and sore for a while. Speaking from experience, like a single drop of HC110 on your skin feels a lot less severe and that could lead to people being complacent and careless where in fact they're accumulating long-term damage to their body. There's nothing you can do about that after it's done, but you kind of don't know until it's too late. And for that reason and kind of how sinister and sneaky it is, yeah, one out of three. Definitely not a two. There are no real special considerations to take on board as described in section seven when dealing with the syrup itself. The main chemical hazard would be to avoid mixing it with strong acids. Our fixer and stop bath don't fall into that category. But what this would mean is when you're disposing of the working solution, put a lot of water down the drain before you ever think about putting like a sulfuric acid drain cleaner down behind it. Just to avoid the risk of those two coming into immediate concentrated contact. Instead, I want to talk about handling the syrup in a practical, physical sense. Because it is the thickest, most viscous chemical that most of us will handle in our darkroom lives, there, I kind of just want to talk about that for a bit. It is quite difficult to measure out in a graduated cylinder as it will cling to the walls of the cylinder itself, and that will require a lot of warm water to rinse it out. I actually don't use HC110 at dilution B for a volume less than 500 milliliters because with my water, it takes more than more water than I'm comfortable to actually rinse the grad cylinder clear than is required to make up 300, 350 mils for a roll of 35. So I'll make up 500 mils and maybe do two rolls or I'll just make up a bunch and do multiple rolls in the tanks at once. Um, if you're working with very small volumes like a 35 or 120 roll, with something like dilution F, as I mentioned, you know, sub 10 milliliter amounts, that's when you start need to looking at things like a syringe, which is what Kodak recommend themselves. You can probably get syringes at your local pharmacy, whether they're for certain uses that I probably can't talk about on YouTube or developing chemicals. Most pharmacies are relatively okay to give them out or at least sell them to you. Lastly, when you have actually mixed up that syrup into the water, it takes a bit more mixing than you probably think. If you're doing inversions, you know, 10 to 20 times, maybe do another five or 10. And if you're using a swizzle stick, don't. If you're doing stirring in a graduated cylinder, give it an extra 15, 20 seconds because, because it's so viscous, it can form like strings, almost like honey in the water where it can appear to be mixed thoroughly as some of it dissolves and the whole solution turns yellow but it actually isn't. And I've caught myself with that once before where I saw it just the way the light hit it and I remixed things properly and it actually was okay in the end. But just to be aware of that. So HC110 gets a two out of three for handling. It's nothing too worrisome. It's just practically a bit annoying to deal with, especially in smaller volumes. I've been using a lot, it a lot for large format photography. You take like 30, 35 mils, something like that to make up a liter at dilution B. Grand, it's really easy to do. Measuring out 3.8 mils for a dilution F for a roll of 35, no thanks. Bearing in mind that this SDS is an American SDS, section 12 notes that although many of the components within this in their pure form are quite hazardous and dangerous, the overall mixture itself is classified as generally non-hazardous, at least in terms of disposal and environmental hazards. Then again, the rules are generally tighter and more restrictive for these things in Europe than they are in the US. So generally I kind of dial things up a notch in terms of how careful I am for Kodak chemicals versus Kodak's own SDS. Section 13 says the usual boilerplate, dispose of it in accordance with local regulations. Okay, my professional nevertheless, opinion, again, is that pretty much any of the working solutions can go down the drain. The stock solution should be of serious concern where you look into it and the concentrate, that being the actual syrup itself, should never be put down the drain under any circumstances. Look into it for yourself if you're working with dilution F once a month, I actually wouldn't worry about it. B in large volumes, like when I do my liter, 
I, I am a bit more careful about how I get rid of that. But if I were working with dilution A or the stock, I would have to sit back and think about how I'm actually going to get rid of that. For these reasons, HG110 gets a 2 out of 3 for disposal. It's not that bad, it's nothing like Fixer, but the higher strengths, the stock solution, and the concentrate itself might be worrisome depending on where you are. So check first. There's no single correct way to use HC110. Sure, dilution B is the most common, but there's no reason you have to do that. Because it can be used at a wide range of dilutions, with pretty good results in a huge range of films, it can be used very economically in all sorts of different tanks, from a Mod 5.4 down to like a Stearman Press to little tiny 35mm tanks. You can use it for whatever you need and you don't need to worry about your minimum amounts of developers quite as much as you do with other developers. I haven't really touched on that, but we won't worry about it for this video. Overall, you can get great economy out of a bottle with potentially hundreds of rolls out of a single one liter bottle. When I got this bottle from the folks at photoshop.ie, they were going for about 27 to 30 euros a bottle each. Now it's like 42 to 45, and even in the States, it was about $30 at the time, now it's closer to 40 to 45, so you're talking 40 to 50% more expensive than it was. It's still a huge amount of film that you can develop with that one single bottle. But if I'm thinking of photo flow as my three out of three benchmark, HC110 now has to get a two out of three for cost. Before we actually tally up the scores, I do need, of course, to give a massive thanks and shout out to the folks at the photoshop.ie for sponsoring this video and video series. I always say, their catalog is always growing, and now I can prove it. Recently, after picking up a few rolls of Ferrania P30, I got talking to them about black and white film stocks and what you could get to kind of expand the breadth of films that we have available here in Ireland. So, based on that discussion, and it wasn't just me, it was something they were already looking into, but kind of looking for feedback on. They've started stocking no color studio films. That's really cool and I've already shot one of them and I'm looking forward to talking about this, all of these range of stocks in the future. They really are fantastic and they're an absolute pleasure to deal with. Even if you aren't based in Ireland, it's probably worth checking out their site if you're based in Europe because the cost of shipping still isn't that bad compared to something like Photo Impex, the retro camera, the big European retailers and their prices, just even in spite of their scale, are very competitive. Massive thanks again to the folks at the photoshop.ie and let's tally up the scores. For safety, HC110 gets one out of three. For handling, two out of three. Disposal, two out of three. And cost, again, two out of three. For a total score of seven out of 12. So to conclude, HC110 is a fantastic developer with great economy and relatively minimal risks, though they can accumulate over time. If you do use a lot of HC110, I hope you at least learned something from watching this video, probably in the safety section. The few people I spoke to while scripting this video weren't aware it's quite as potentially bad as it is. It's not the worst thing in the world, but the risks kind of accumulate and they don't really go away long term. It's the long term health effects that make it more concerning. I think the benefits of its high activity, its usefulness for expired film and its breadth of substrates it can be used with, like plates, kind of outweigh that because all you need to do to get around it is use basic PPE and common sense. If you have any thoughts about HC110, I'd be interested to hear them in the comments down below. But otherwise, that is all I have to say about Codex HC110. So stay safe and bye bye for now. If you don't already, follow me on Instagram at Chaka1277 for new pictures every day. If you like this video and enjoy what I do on the channel, please consider subscribing or checking out my Patreon where the tiers start at just one euro per month.